did a lot of work on dairy farms uh, and pest management and those systems. Went up to Cornell, um, kind of got a nice dose of biological control um, and vegetable pest management. And then I got hired at Virginia Tech at the Eastern Shore um, to the far right on that map, uh, the bottom part of the Delmarva Peninsula. And there's a uh, research station out there. I was there for nine years, very focused on uh, agricultural production and um, vegetables in particular. Um, and then 2010, I moved to campus in Blacksburg, Virginia, where I've been ever since, but still doing um, vegetable pest management programs statewide. So that's kind of my experience. Um, one thing that I have done uh, over the last 20 years is um, evaluate insecticides. So both some conventional products that, you know, there's a lot of safer, better materials that are coming along that, to replace some of our more toxic for conventional growers. And I do a lot of evaluating of those to see what they kill, what they don't kill, their impacts on natural enemies. Um, and then also some OMRI certified organic products evaluating those. And that's what we're going to hear about today is some of those trials. Um, but Although I've conducted a bunch and my, and my uh, team has conducted a bunch over the last 20 years, no one has conducted more um, that I know of, definitely on the eastern part of the U.S. than Dr. Galen Dively, um, University of Maryland, definitely a mentor of mine through the years. But he um, had some grants and a lot of support to evaluate these over many years and evaluate the same products um, and collect a lot of data. and. I have some uh, some slides that he's he's definitely welcomed me to present, and I think they help enhance um, some of the efficacy trials here. Yeah, there's Galen right there. Okay, so you're growing organically. It doesn't matter what it is, field crops, vegetables, and there are a lot of reasons for, for pest outbreaks. I agree that when you grow things properly and the and the agroecosystem is very healthy. Um, certain pest problems tend to be less. And, you know, I, I support that. I agree with that. Monoculture has definitely um, caused some, some pest problems, but there are a lot of reasons for pest outbreaks. And no matter what you do and how well you do it, some reasons, some, some seasons, you will just get an absolute outbreak of some pests. And, and, uh, it's often climate driven. There's there's other factors, but um, it's very very complex. Very hard to predict, um, and you know that's that's just a fact. And the truth is, we we end up facing having to control these pests or decide what kind of losses we can tolerate, um, and and still get by with farming. And we're all aware of that. And that's that's what we're talking about today. So under the National Organic Program. Um, you know, your first line of defense should not be pesticides if you're following a, an organic program. I mean, you should be trying to minimize pest problems by all the other ways, you know, growing your crop healthy, um, using biological control, maybe avoiding pests by your planting date, um, row covers and things like that. So it's only when those systems don't work that you're, you're faced with, you know, a um, put out the fire kind of control, what can I do? I mean, I've got this problem now and we've got to, we've got to take care of it or we're going to lose our crop. So that's where pesticides come in. And there are, um, there's a lot out there. I will say if you Google and you probably know just as much as I do, it's almost endless, the number of options. And the reason it's endless is because the registrations and what you can say on labels and what you can say on brochures and advertisements isn't quite the same as you might get with some of these conventional products that are so you get a lot of things that say a lot of things and there's a lot of um a lot of products out there and just trying to sift through you know which ones should I probably use for which pests and which ones are probably not what they claim to be um and that's that's what we're gonna go with today and I'll say I you know to say someone's an expert I got experience. I've got experience running um, experimental trials. So not just I tried it and I swear by it. I, this, these are, you know, replicated trials and it's going to basically provide the data and, and 
some of it's up to, there's a lot still to learn. I'm always interested in new options. Um, in fact, I presented a talk just a month ago at a potato meeting and I'm now got a new research project this season because of what, um, what, what one of the growers um, told me and what they thought about something and I'm gonna actually experiment with it. So we're always learning, always communicating. So there are OMRI certified and national organic um, registered products. There's a um, list of actually 374 products currently. These are both fungicides, insecticides. Um, but you know, there's kind of your your groupings, and we're going to go through we're going to go through these just to kind of see which ones might offer you some uh, some options. And but one thing that is true, generally true for for all of them, is that compared with some of the conventional synthetic standards, there's some things that you need to expect with most of the organic insecticides. They're they're going to be shorter lived. They don't have quite the residual. Um, it's tough when you're going with a natural product to com compete with something that's been synthesized to have a long residual, um, which means you got to probably apply them often in some pest situations. Um, and you know, you're, there really aren't systemic options like you have with conventional insecticides. Sometimes the shelf life, because these are biologicals, um, isn't quite there, you know, on par with the, and then there, and then there's cost, um, as as many of you know, and we're going to talk about the efficacy, the last one here, um, you know, what might you expect about using some of these? So let's go through some of the rundown. So one of the options you have is pesticidal soaps, products like um, Desex, Impede, Safer Soap. These actually are very good on certain kind of insects. Um, there's potassium salts of fatty acids. That's one of the types of soaps that, that works really well. So they work because if there are soft-bodied insects, this basically breaks down their, their outer shell or their cuticle um, with that soap, which has lipids in it. Um, and these insects end up dying. You basically destroy their, their lipid layer on their outer shell and they end up desiccating um, and uh, dying. So, this does work against things like aphids, um, you know, some other soft-bodied insects, mites, and things like. Well, that's not an insect, but um, you get the point. So, you know, I think aphids. This is a really good um, non-disruptive tactic, and aphids. You know, you can you can slowly make sure that this doesn't happen. This is a complete aphid outbreak, and they reproduce asexually, so this can happen very easily. Often this happens when conventional growers spray things like pyrethroids. That's you know, a really common insecticide, which kills the natural enemies, often does not kill the aphids. And the aphids then reproduce like crazy and you end up getting like this in a, from melon aphid in a pumpkin field. Um, this often doesn't happen on organic farms because um, you allow these guys, the natural enemies to, to do their thing. And there's a lot of predators and, and uh, parasitoids that help keep aphid populations in check. So if you can use something like a soap, which can help knock back some of the aphids, but not kill these insects, um, kind of the one-two punch can help, help keep aphids down. So this isn't just for vegetables. Uh, grain crops can get a lot of aphid problems. Um, and there's things like barley yellow dwarf virus, which can be transmitted by aphids, well, which is transmitted by aphids. And you know, so there are, and natural enemies will help get rid of those aphids, but you may, you know, you may opt for, for some of these soaps to help, help knock back some of those populations. In addition to soaps, there's some various oils that are um, recertified. And, you know, what, what, can you, what can you get out of those? What kind of pests? Very similar pests. It's kind of same, same strategy here. You're getting the same kind of pests like mites and aphids, soft-bodied, small insects. Um, but in addition, because these are oils, things like fish oil and, and some various other ones, um, they can be used as a, uh, a hydrophobic adjuvant that can be used with some other pesticides. So what you might use these for, in addition to um, controlling some of these softer insects, is 
adding an oil to some of your other pesticides to help it spread and stick on the leaves and things like that. So these are valuable um, for a lot of reasons and maybe a good good thing to have in the uh, in the toolbox for or, or, or organic growers. Okay, let's get into some of the botanical extracts and there are a lot out there. I have not even touched on all the products that might be around, but when you get into these secondary plant compounds, um, essential oils, if you will, that are produced by a lot of different plants, you'll see that many of them, there's a product that's kind of out there and selling that as a, as a you know, the next insecticide. Um, most of them smell nice. So you're, you're going to get, um, you know, an insecticide that's kind of pleasant smelling, if, if not overpowering sometimes. And there are a lot of papers, a lot of research studies that are done that can show that these things can affect the behavior of insects. Insects use um, smell and sensing chemicals with their antennae. It's a big way that they find plants and, and know that it's a host plant and things like that. And I mean, these are pretty overpowering um, compounds and they can, they can disrupt that. So they're antifeedants. Um, can even disrupt the neuroreceptors in, in insects. So they can really mess them up basically. Uh, and again, these can also, because they're oils, use, be used as, as adjuvants. I'll tell you a little anecdote. And I was on the Eastern shore of Virginia um, working with uh, conventional. So these aren't organic farmers, but this was some big time conventional tomato production. Um, some big companies driven out of Florida that were growing on the Eastern shore. And we had a hellacious thrips outbreak one year. And uh, at some point, the entire Eastern shore smelled like peppermint. Um, and the reason behind it was they were putting Ecotech, which has uh, rosemary oil and peppermint oil in their tanks. Um, and you know their, their claim was that it, it agitates thrips and they're coming out of the flowers and it allows the other chemicals to uh, kill them. And that was, and um, I think it was also to hide some of the real stinky organophosphates that were going down. But nonetheless, um, they were used by a lot of different growers and um, they have some options. And I'm going to get into efficacy in a little bit, but I'm kind of giving you a rundown of some of the products. Hey, Tom. Yes. Quick yeah. question that came up around oils. Can those be mix, tank mixed with surround? Uh, that's going to cause possibly a problem. Uh, you know, surround's going to be a suspension of a powder. And I, I don't think mixing with, I don't, not 100% sure. I've not tried it, but I just don't think a suspension of a powder and, and some of these oils are going to go. I mean, the one thing you find with surround anyway is uh, it's gonna clog up. It's gonna cause some problems in your, um, in your nozzles and, and tips because you know it's a powder. You're basically spraying a clay powder. And I'm, I'm gonna get into surround a little bit later. Uh, if someone else has some experience, I would love to hear it. But I, I think the combo of an oil plus a powder that's already clogging is, is probably a recipe for some problems. But um, I'd love to hear if someone has actually tried, tried mixing those. I'm going to talk about, I think, Katie Britt, PhD, Dr. Katie Britt, who just defended her PhD working on hemp, IPM, done a great job with that, uh, actually tried some of these against hemp russet mite, which has become an emerged um, pest of this new crop that's really taken off across the country. Um, this tiny little mite you can't see without magnification. Um, can really build up to hellacious numbers, especially in greenhouses and then when transplants go out to the field. So growers have had to deal with this. And um, Katie ran a, a trial inside a greenhouse on a, you know, on a pretty heavy hemp russet mite infestation. And here's some of these products we've just mentioned, things like Impede, the soaps. Uh, PLP has essential oils and um, and the Agrimec, by the way, is a, is a synthetic miticide at kind of the top, top standard for miticide. So you can see how some of these oils and things and soaps did in comparison to a, a nice conventional product. And 
you know, you're going to get, it's going to help you. It's going to help you with your mic problems using some of these products. And you will see sulfur at the top there. I, I didn't mention sulfur yet, but this is an OMRI certified um, pesticide. It's our oldest known pesticide that humans have been using. Um, it goes back to 3,000 years. It was documented that we use sulfur to, to control pests. Uh, it's, it's good for some, as a fungicide against some things like powdery mildews and rust, but also will knock back mites, as you saw on the previous slide, and things like thrip. So it's an option out there um, and maybe a good one for miticides. <clears throat> okay, there's a lot of garlic and cedar oil. I, I, I don't have a lot of experience with either of one of these. Um, I did once try a garlic extract. It stunk like heck um, and didn't work, but I don't have a lot of data. And Galen Dively uh, doesn't, doesn't think that a lot of these um, provide a lot either, um, but I'm not going to not going to badmouth something that I haven't fully tested completely, but I do want to bring your attention. There's some other things out there, garlic and, and cedar oils, but I'm going to move into an oil that does, I think, have a lot of applications, and that's neem oil. Many of you are familiar with this kind of a magical tree um, see growing in tropical areas in Africa and Asia, and this tree produces, you can get oils from the seeds, and there is no pesticide or chemical out there that can affect insects in the number of ways that it seems like azadirectins can. They can cause anti-feeding behavior where the insects don't wanna feed on a plant. They can detect it. It'll re repel certain insects. Um, and probably a big way that it works is as an insect growth regulator. If an insect ingests this um, or gets it into its system, it interferes with the ability for the, of that insect to develop and you'll have like immatures not molting to the next stage and dying. And um, that's probably the number one way that the, this insecticide group works. Um, but a lot of research has been done on this, especially in, in other countries. But there are a lot of products that are available here in the US um, that have neem extracts and azadiractins, the active ingredient in there. Um, a is a direct, and you can see some of the products here. Um, and we're going to get into, again, I'm going to talk about some efficacy here in a second, but that keep those in mind, a is a direct. And, and now I'm showing you this. Um, hopefully everyone recognizes these as, as mums, chrysanthemums. And this is kind of getting into another really big organic insecticide. Um, and that is the pyrethrins or pyrethrum and found in a product called Pyganic primarily right now marketed. And these are a really, really impressive insecticide that um, is produced by chrysanthemum flowers. And it's more than one active ingredient, these pyrethrins. Um, and they are, they're an excellent knockdown. There's, there's almost nothing that can knock an, a fly out of the air or knock an insect down faster than pyrethrins. They're very quick acting, nerve, nervous, they attack the nervous system. Um, the drawback, if you will, of natural pyrethrins is that they don't stick around. They are a quick knockdown, but sunlight breaks them down rapidly and the insect breaks them down rapidly. So you might knock it down, but immediately the insect starts detoxifying it and it ends up not killing it. Um, but sometimes it does do it in. So sometimes that knockdown's enough that it, it's impaired it and the insect dies. So it's kind of a, um, a neat knockdown option, but to expect long-term um, and, and excellent results is often a challenge with, with Pyganic. But um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about these. Now, I did mention azadiractins from neem oil and, and now pyrethrins. And there is a product, Azera. Many of you have probably used it that combines both. It's commercial mix already. It's got both of these. So kind of two different mode of actions. And, and um, so what we're going to get into is testing those along with what I think is if you're an organic grower, um, I would not have this or not, not have this in my toolbox. Spinosins or Entrust as the organic product is one of the most effective for the, for the insects that it kills, one of the most effective 
organic insecticides that you can get, especially for thrips and lepidopter and larvae. Um, among the options, you can't get anything any better than this. It is um, top notch. In fact, there's conventional insecticides that is the same thing. And they're some of the top conventional insecticides that have spinose in them. Uh, just a little quick uh, anecdote here or, or uh, about how they found spinose. And so they found it under an old rum distillery in a Caribbean island, which is still top secret of which island. But they found it, um, again, it was Dow AgroSciences at the time doing some exploratory searches for for chemicals that might have activity on on mammals and insects and things and and they got a hit they found this in the soil um, it's a soil uh, microbe that when fermented it produces a metabolite spinosin that very very active on on insects so that's what it is uh naturally derived omri certified and trust is the is the product um, so what we're going to show you now is a rundown of insecticide trials. Now, one thing that a lot of you have faced um, is there's a lot of discussion about what works. Everyone seems to have the answers to, to pest problems. And you'll, and I've heard this in my 20 year career, uh, you know, someone telling me that this is the best, the best thing for that because they put it out and I didn't see any, whatever, fill in the blank. I sprayed that and I didn't see a single cucumber beetle. I sprayed that. I had no Colorado potato beetles. That's good. Did you have a control plot to know that you would have had a lot of control, a lot of beetles if you hadn't sprayed? And the often the answer is no. So it could have been a year that you, we didn't have any potato beetles anyway. Um, so always keep that in mind. Um, and it's good to do that. That's a good test. But then running tests over multiple years, running tests where you've got a control to know if I didn't do this, what was gonna happen um, is really, really important. And we're gonna basically show those randomized controlled experiments through multiple years um, and just evaluation of some of these things. So the first pest group we're gonna talk about is, uh, is flea beetles. Um, these little tiny beetles, and I know that someone's already asked a question about flea beetle control. So here we go. Um, flea beetles are big on our brassicas. There's certain species that hit those. And then there's a whole other group in a different genus that attack things like eggplant, solanaceous plants. Um, so you can basically test either of those cropping systems. But, you know, there's relevance for tobacco and anything else that would have flea beetle problems. So here's four of the most common products. And what we're going to see, these are some of Galen Dively's data for multiple years. Every one of those dots is a trial. That's a lot of data, um, flea beetle data, but it's pretty strong in suggesting that, you know, you can get some control with, with the Pyganix or your Azera, which has it. And then there's Entrust um, working really well. The neem oils, maybe not so much for flea beetle control. So really good, strong data. It kind of tells you your best options for, for flea beetle control. Um, but with organic systems, a lot of times, I would start with a row cover if it's possible or feasible for things like flea beetles, because it's those early young plants that are most susceptible. And if you can keep the beetles off early on, then your plants are probably good to go. So, uh, you know, maybe a combination of starting that way, keeping beetles off early. And then when you take them off, you've got some of those insecticide options if you still have bad flea beetle problems. So, okay, how about moving into some, uh, some Lepidopteran um, pests? This one's imported cabbage worm on cabbage. So what are some good options? Well, there's no doubt Entrust is, is a terrific Lepidopteran insecticide and it, it was the best material. But you know, the, you can see we're a combo like a Zara. It has both pyrethrins plus the azadiractins that combo might have been a little bit better than either of them by themselves. So this is a pest where Azera, you know, is a pretty good option as well. Um, so, okay, moving on to 
another really bad pest. If you grow potatoes, if you grow eggplant in Virginia, you, you're familiar with this pest. Colorado potato beetle um, can be really, really bad. It sets up shop on a farm and seems to never go away. Um, if you can't, if you keep planting those those uh, crops. So what do we have to battle this pest, which can be resistant to a lot of different things? And well, there's your interest again, working great. Um, and here is another example of where Azera would be a step up from Pyganic. And the reason in this case is that the beetle has developed resistance to pyrethrins, as you can see, they don't work that well. But azadiractins can, can be a nice material to control potato beetle larvae. And um, th these data from, from Galen Diley really illustrate that. So two good options for potato beetle, spinosin and entrust. And, um, all right, moving on. Potato leaf hopper. Hey, this Thomas, is one. To, yes, yes, Ben, go ahead. Quick, quick question related to those last few charts. Um, there was a question around what the different colors mean, the black versus the red. Oh, okay. Um, I th gosh, I got to go back. I'm pretty sure that black may not have had all of all four of the insecticides. As you can see, there's no black on the entrust. Um, so I think it's where uh, instances where just some of them might have been tested and not not all of them. Uh, I'll have to go back and, and double check that. But I, yeah, actually, I forgot exactly what the red is because these were Galen Dively's. And um, I really forgot and I apologize. But I think that's the case, especially since there's no black under like in trust. I think that was something that was tested later um, after the fact. But really good question. <clears throat> All right, let's move into Mexican bean beetle. If you grow snap beans or, or things like that, um, any of the edible potted beans. And especially in the cooler areas in the mountains in the western part of the state, Piedmont, maybe northern Virginia, this is a pest that you that you're familiar with. It's a Phytophagus lady beetle. So it's not all lady beetles are our friends. This one feeds on beans, um, and is if you're growing beans, would not be considered a friend. That's what it does. Can be really damaging. And here's how these four insecticides fared out and you know there's a lot of things that can help knock back mexican bean beetle so that's that's good but in trust and and your azaras and nemex you know the azadiractins are working pretty well this is to control larvae by the way um i should point these out azadiractins aren't going to do much on adult insects like beetles but their larvae the larvae won't be able to molt so that's that's important <laughs> All right, cucumber beetles. I know someone had a question about what to do about cucumber beetles. They can be really bad. Um, things like melons, and there, we have some plants that are have bacterial wilt susceptibility, and this beetle transmits bacterial wilt and kill the whole plant. Um, not to mention they can take out seedlings because they can mass on them, scar up fruit later. This is just a nasty pest, highly attracted to cucurbit plants. Um, so definitely one we have to battle. And how are these four insecticides doing against cucumber beetles? You know, nothing's gonna give you 90, 90% control. I mean, it's just a tough insect because adult beetles just keep coming. And um, spinosin's not the greatest inherently against cucumber beetles to begin with. So the rest of these, because they're short-lived, the beetles keep coming and there's just some residue that doesn't, that's just not out there to kill these beetles, but you can knock them back a little bit with any of these products. But the good thing with cucumber beetles, there's some other strategies you can use. You can use row covers to protect young, young plants. Um, that definitely works. And there's trap cropping. Beetles will be drawn to certain cucurbit plants over others. Things like um, blue hubbard squash is highly attractive. So you can plant blue hubbard squash and also highly tolerant of cucumber beetles. So you can plant that, draw all the beetles to blue hubbard squash, and then they, they kind of stay off of your um, melons and cucumbers and stuff like that for, for a little bit. 
which can help get those plants going and, and vines running. And, and um, you know, you may choose to kill them on the blue Hubbard squash and then you kind of knock them out. Uh, but that trap cropping approach does help and you can kind of keep your beetles on certain plants and, and not on ones that you don't want them to be. <clears throat> Japanese beetle, another big pest we've battled with for, um, well, since this beetle came in from Japan um, decades ago, it is, uh, it can really rip up some foliage and it's got a pretty broad host range. It feeds on a lot of different plants. So this is, could be anything from basil to cut flowers, to rose bushes, to snap beans, to eggplant. I mean, this thing feeds on a lot of plants. Um, you can knock it back. Azera is probably a decent option, as you can see in the slides here. It's really tight. You're getting about 80% control every time you've, it's been tested. So there are some options, some sprays it can use if these things get out of hand. <clears throat> okay, going to move into a pest that's all-encompassing. Hey, yes, yes. Go ahead, Ben. One, one more question about the charts. Um, someone was asking, as you read them, uh, how do you know which is the most effective solution? Excellent, excellent. Thank you. I should have explained that. My apologies, but maybe it's not too late. All of these graphs, you see percent control as the y-axis. So I should have explained that. My apologies. Thank you, whoever asked the question. These dots represent a single trial. Um, so that's across, all. every time you see a bunch of dots, it's tested that many times. The squares represent the kind of the uh, variation of the data, how, how tight you would, how reliable is the percent control. Um, in this case, you would see like really tight control with Azera. It's gonna give you about 80% control, very reliably with not much variation. Whereas if you've not tested it much, like in trust, only one trial, you got a lot of variability right now because you haven't tested it that much. So that's what that means. It's always percent control. So the higher it is up the scale, the better it works. So I should have explained that. Um, and there it is though. Okay, thrips. These pests are, I can't think of a crop that doesn't have thrips that it'll at least get in the flowers, can cause some problems. Uh, they transmit um, tomato spot of wilt virus to things like tomatoes. You see on the bottom left, some fruit, some funky looking psychedelic fruit from a wilt virus infected plant. It can, when they get in the flowers, they can cause things like gold flecking on the fruit. When they get on, uh, there's foliage feeding thrips that can just suck the life out of uh, young seedlings um, of a lot of different things, crops like cotton and, and, uh, peanuts. So thrips can be really damaging. And there's some areas of Virginia, like South side that just have uh, really bad thrips problems, high numbers. Um, so definitely a pest we got to deal with in a lot of systems. So how about some of these? What are, what are your options? The good news is that the best thrips material on the planet is spinosad. I don't care if you're a conventional grower or an organic grower, you have spinosad which is your best tool. Problem is you can't spray spinosad more than, you know, maybe a couple times, two to three times, or you're gonna max out. You can't spray it anymore legally. So you have a, the best tool, use it wisely when you need it. Um, how do some of these other things do? Well, you can see in these trials, these are, this was a um, tomato trial on the Eastern shore of Virginia. And you got thrips on the leaves and then you got percentage of fruit damage at harvest. These were different kinds of thrips, tobacco thrips and then flower thrips. And you kind of see how things are faring out and you can see Entrust or Spinosin just being the, the best um, across the board. But, you know, there's things like essential oils that actually, you know, might be doing a little bit. We think it, we think it does and conventional growers are actually using some ecotech. Um, but then things like azadiractins work really well against flower thrips, as you can see on the, on the bottom right there. So there, there are some options, but nothing better than Entrust um, for thrips. Here's some of Galen's trials. Again, this is percent control in several different crops. 
different thrips and you kind of see the entrust really uh, faring out better than, than all the others and a lot of variability going on. And that's, that's par for the course with thrips control, really hard to control. Nothing better than entrust for, for a thrip. So that was a lot of rundown, a lot of trials, went through them quickly. Here's kind of a summary slide. If you do get some access to these slides and this might be the one that says it all for kind of with these four at least can provide you against this range of pests. Um, now we're gonna get into some specific cases here in Virginia that we got to deal with annually. And corn earworm and our sweet corn is a uh, problem. This is a really hard situation going on nationally is to try to get this worm out of our corn, um, out of our sweet corn. And so here's some of Galen's trials or, or one insecticide trial where we had the Nemix, Pyganic, and Trust, those three. And you know, I'd said it before, there's and Trust is a really good lepidopteran material. And um, in this trial in in Beltsville, Maryland, you know, it provided excellent control of corn earworm. And you see the percent damaged ears, it's almost a hundred percent in the Nemix, Pyganic, and untreated control. So really, really good control. So in trust, no doubt, is is one of your better options against corn earworm uh, for organic growers. But how about BT? When if you're an organic grower, you know what BT is, um, bacteria that, you know, in the early 1900s, the Japanese found it was killing their silkworms that they were using for silk production. And um, they figured out what it was. They, they saw the crystalline proteins that are toxic and they disrupt the midgut of insects and they're specific to certain kind of insects and the gut contents create a pore or the gut, there's a pore created in the gut, gut contents spill out and it kills the insect. That's how they work. Um, there's kind of a little diagram here. Um, the big thing to keep in mind, BTs have to be ingested. They are not gonna work unless that protein is ingested by the insect and solubilized, and then it's activated where it's going to attach to the receptor sites in the midgut, create a pore, ultimately kill the insect. So um, that's how they work. There are BTs for different types of insects and what most commonly used in organic agriculture are for the leps, the worm pests and things like dipels, antari, javelin, these are all um, BT sprayable, OMRI certified products that kill caterpillars, they kill them very well. There's over a hundred products containing BT on the market. And here is one cropping system where they are fantastic. That is the brassica crops, your broccolis, your collards, cabbage, things like that. There are a lot of caterpillars that attack those crops, diamondback moth, cabbage looper, imported cabbage worm, and just a, several others, um, different army worms. And the BTs are active on all of those caterpillar pests. The other beauty is they're, you have some time with brassica plants. Sometimes the leaf feeding isn't what you worry about. If you're growing broccoli and the head hasn't formed yet, you know, a little bit of leaf feeding is not going to kill you. And you, it gives you time to have a caterpillar ingest the BT, die, and not be there later to infest the, the broccoli head or the cabbage head. Uh, so BTs work really well in those instances. Um, and here is a, uh, a really good trial. Um, this one's from my, my colleague, Jim Wagenbach at NC State. And I put it up here because he got, um, he tested a lot of different products and a lot of different BTs just to show you how well they worked. And, you know, we're getting 90, an increase of 90 some percent, above 90% um, marketable heads when you just use BTs. So that's, that's excellent. It's as good as you can get. Um, so that's just how well that these things work in those, in those systems. Some other good uses of BT are army worms. Now, and this, this is more than just vegetables. You got army worms that attack things like wheat, some of your grain crops, like corn, you get army worms, you get fall army worms. And in particular in Virginia, army worms will uh, clip that wheat head. So you've grown that wheat crop through the winter. 
getting ready for harvest and these dang caterpillars can come in like an army and clip those wheat heads off and, and uh, really impact your yield. So you don't want to have that happen. If you're trying to grow organic wheat or something like that, um, BTs may be your option. They are very effective on things like army worms. So um, really good option. So back to this corn earworm and sweet corn. So you got in trust one option, but in sweet corn, you often need multiple sprays and you're only going to get maybe two to three sprays out of an entrust. So how is BT? Is BT going to give you something in sweet corn? And I will say if I gave this talk 10, 20 years ago, I would say BT's probably a good option in sweet corn, a good rotational tool. I can't say that anymore. Um, Here's a sweet corn trial we did last year in Whitethorn, Virginia. Dipel Zentari are two different BTs products. Uh, they didn't work compared to a product like Corrigin that gave you almost 100% clean airs. These aren't working against corn earworm. Reason is corn earworms develop resistance to BT, the proteins that are in there. And it's from the use of transgenic GMO, uh, BT corn and BT cotton has selected for resistance in this and now and now the bt sprayable products don't work so that's a fact that's in virginia we can't kill corn airworm anymore with the bt products or at least kill it very well other bt options uh there's a bt for colorado potato beetle this is a different protein that's selectively kills beetles it's also by the way very good on mexican bean beetle larvae as well um Blackhawk is spinosad. So you see that being a very good product. Savanto is a synthetic product. You can't use that, but there are options for potato beetle. And um, I will say currently there's not a product that has BT tenebrianus. Certus had one and they pulled it off the shelves and then it's coming back though. Um, so there will be again, a BT product for potato beetle and Mexican bean beetles. Um, all right, let's get into some other newer products that you may not have heard of, but you're, you know, they're out there now and, and what might they have? So there's other additional bacterial derived insecticides other than BT. There are a lot of chromobacteria or Burkholderia. These bacteria are proteobacteria. So, um, okay, yeah, I like this quote. So 99% of, all right, both bacteria and insects kind of get this negative connotation right off the bat. Think of an insect and people think of pests. Think of a bacteria, people think bad, germ. And the truth is that 99% of both insects and bacteria are beneficial. So there are a lot of beneficial bacteria out there and there are um, proteobacteria that are kind of work hand in hand with other systems and make them work well. And we're just now starting to tap into these bacteria and the magical things that they do. One thing they do is create pores, pore forming bacteria. So what that does is allow movement of other things into systems to allow some, you know, a combination of things to work. This is in our guts. This is in um, a lot of different symbiotic relationships that are going on in the world. And, but a pore forming bacteria can also be used you know, to attack another type of insect that we're forming a pore may not be beneficial. So this is how a lot of these end up working. And um, so, you know, things like chromobacteria and Burkholderia, they're starting to uh, create products that have, that have these in there and they've had some activity and some published research on some various insects. And these products are out there. Things like Grandivo, Venerate, and Magistine is a bionomaticide. So we've been playing around with some of these the last few years. Here's a, um, well, this, this trial, actually, I want to show you, this isn't mine, but, and I know we're not talking about turf probably in this group too much, but I can tell you annual bluegrass weevil is a really serious problem for golf courses. It's developed resistance to synthetic insecticides and just showing you that these products like Grandivo and Venerate actually providing some pretty good control of the larvae against annual bluegrass weevil, just kind of a demonstration of potential power and the potential of these for systems. 
I'm using this because this is a weevil. There may be weevil larvae that attack your pest or your crop. Um, there's a lot of different weevils that attack different crops. And this might be something to experiment with. Maybe you have a researcher come and do some trials because it seems to have some activity against those. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, back to hemp russet mile, russet mite. This is Katie Britt again, spraying for russet mites. And how did things like Grandivo and Venerate do against that? And, you know, Grandivo didn't seem to do anything on the russet mites, but Venerate, you know, gave you about 50% control. So maybe a little something going on and maybe some more research needs to be done. But here's some things that we're really encouraged about. Magistine uh, is registered as a nematicide. And this is, uh, these are some trials that have been done in Florida. Um, just showing you on, on potatoes and root knot nematode on tomatoes, showing you can actually control these plant parasitic nematodes with, with this magistine. We've been looking at it for wireworms and, you know, really difficult pests. Wireworms and white grubs are down in the soil. They attack the roots, attack things like potato tubers, sweet potatoes. We have been, got a graduate student, um, Mika Pagani, who is looking at this and getting really encouraging results, just applying this um, product and, and actually controlling things like wireworms and white grubs, which are tough to control but really reducing the, the wireworm damage to potato tubers when these are applied in furrow. Um, so these are just some trials. I'll just zip through them, uh, you know, but we're getting really encouraging results with these, with these products. Now, moving on to uh, some insect pathogens. So insects have their own pathogens that attack them. In addition to bacteria, you got their own fungal pathogens, enema pathogenic fungi, they're called. Two of the biggest are Bouveria, Bassiana, and Metarhizium, and Asopliae. These are common. They are out naturally killing insects, but they've also been um, concentrated into products where the spores and things like that can be applied, and you basically cause a disease, a fungal disease. They are not going to cause damage to humans or anything else. They're entomopathogenic. They kill insects. That's all they do. And um, so. These occur naturally, they're in some products. So Bouveria bassiana can be found in two popular products, Botanigard and Bottega. And these are things that are, um, by the way, the name Bouveria bassiana was named after Augustino Bassi, who discovered it, an Italian entomologist. Um, just a little trivial tidbit there. But uh, this is a white, kind of a white uh, cottony, um, sometimes chalky, disease when the insect, when that starts to sporulate, you, you, that's what you see. Sometimes it looks like a frosted donut, the insect, and that's the spores blowing off of an insect that was killed by this fungus. So if you ever see those out in the field naturally, that's what that is. So you can actually apply these to soil, apply these to as a foliar spray. And um, they've gotten, for example, excellent control of things like mites and Colorado potato beetle, believe it or not, um, trial goes back to the 80s, 75% reduction in pests with just sprays of Bouveria controlling potato beetle. So there's a lot of potential against uh, a lot of different insects and a lot of research still needs to be done. Metarhizium, uh, probably more research needs to be done on this one. This one causes kind of a greenish color sporulation um, when the insect the insect dies of, of this fungus <laughs> works really well in the soil uh, probably better in the soil and um, we've been playing around with it a little bit with some trials um, there's probably some more, more more work that needs to be done and here's a new one I haven't got a lot of experience with but PFR 97 seems to work well you know, as a drench treatment against some soil insects and in greenhouses some data on thrips and white flies. So just another product that's out there worth trying. I'm getting into another biological insecticide. There are some viruses, and this was really hard to work on a, a virus against a pest when we're battling the coronavirus. So it was kind of, it just didn't seem right. 
Um, but understanding viruses, they're highly specific to the species that they're that they're um, attacking. And in this case, this is a virus that's highly specific to corn earworm, or at least the genus Helicoverpa, the corn earworms in. Um, so there are products that kill armyworms, like fall armyworm, beet armyworm. And there's a virus product that's on the market, like SpotX. And then there's some that um, kill corn earworms. And Helogen and Gemstar are two of the products that are out there. So what you're doing is basically spraying the, um, the virus uh, occlusion bodies and they're ingested by the, they have to be ingested to work. And then the insect gets the virus, the disease kills the insect and you end up with just creating disease and epizootics they're called where it just spreads through the population. Um, here's an example. Uh, they have had a great use in hemp because they are registered for use on hemp. These NPV products like Helogen, Gemstar, and um, I'll again point to Katie Britt and her work on hemp IPM where we've sprayed these and seen the disease larvae um, and actually seen the effect that they're doing. And, and um, again, they're only killing corn earworm, but in the case of hemp, that is by far the number one pest of, of hemp going right now is corn earworm. And we got a product that's labeled that just kills corn earworms. We tried it in sweet corn. This is a tough battle keeping earworms out of sweet corn, but we did a demo on a farm, three different plantings, and we actually increased the percentage of marketable ears by just spraying halogen. Uh, we couldn't believe it because we hadn't gotten as good a results in small plot trials, but doing it on a larger scale um, on the farm, we actually did reduce reduce earworms and reduce um, market or increased marketable ears. So again, um, hemp is probably going to be a, a really good use. Here's um, yeah, hemp and corn earworm is a big problem right now. And a lot of the products are OMRI certified, um, what there is available for, for hemp growers. So we've done some work in the lab with some bioassays against corn earworm because it's such a bad problem. Here's just, again, confirming that the BTs like javelin, dipel, zentari aren't the greatest, um, but things like Entrust, which by the way, you can't spray on hemp legally. Um, we wish we could because it's a really good product. Here's another trial where, uh, you know, the BTs weren't weren't working, but in in, in trust was going to be the uh, the better material. Now Gemstar didn't work too well in the bioassays. That's the that's the virus product. The problem was because we didn't. Gemstar takes a while to work. The insect gets diseased, stop, stops feeding, but it's really not going to die. For a while. So field trials are a better indication of that. And fortunately, Katie got a really good trial. This is, there's a lot of products here. I don't need you to um, take it all in. I'll point out some of the highlights here. But Katie ran this trial at in Blackstone, Virginia, got excellent corn earworm pressure on hemp. And um, you can kind of see some things. What I want to draw your attention to is Pyganic doesn't work. You see that to the far left. Just had a ton of corn earworms where we sprayed pyganic. But to the far right, Corrigen is, is your top of the line synthetic material. And Trust is very good as well. You can't use either of those in hemp. But you can use Helogen, can use Gemstar. And you can see them kind of given pretty good control at the field level rates um, or field level scale test. And then maybe combining a, the virus with Bottega if you remember, that's the enemapathogenic fungus. You know, that, that worked really well. Um, so what this has done is given us maybe a glimmer of hope that we might have some things to suggest to hemp growers that, that are going to work maybe better than what they were using. All right. Um, what is my time here? 104. I think I got, this goes to, I only got a couple more slides. I'm getting into stink bugs now. So stink bugs, if you're an organic grower, this is one of your serious, serious challenges because there are not too many organic insecticides that are great against stink bugs. Part of the problem is stink bugs tend to be hard to kill. A lot of these oils and things like that, they're not going to work. The, and that they come, they move about on, on various plants. So whatever's fruiting, they kind of move from this plant to that plant. Um, and because adults are doing that, it's hard to kill them 
Uh, you don't know where they're coming from and when they're coming. Um, part two of why stink bugs are a big issue. This is across more than vegetables. This is tree fruit. This is field crops like soybeans, corn. Stink bugs have become a big, big problem in Virginia. We have now brown marmorated stink bug well established. This invasive species from, from China has just become the major stink bug on, in a lot of systems. More bugs than we've ever seen before on a lot of our crops doing a lot of damage. We also have now the southern green stink bug, which kind of looks like the green stink bug, but it's one that we've not dealt with in Virginia. It's been a southern pest, and now, you know, probably given to uh, climate change, we're getting some of these more southern pests than we've ever had before. Eastern shore of Virginia, southern green stink bug was the most dominant bug, and I can tell you five years ago, I had never seen one before, um, and now we've got it big time. All right. Back to organic insecticides and stink bugs. So I had a student, um, Adam Moorhead, who we were trying to find something for organic growers because they really suffer from, especially if you're growing peppers and tomatoes. We tested everything under the sun, all these organic products that I've reviewed already, and um, none of them worked. We could get some efficacy in the lab, enough to get us encouraged. We'd take it to the field, spray it weekly, and we could not reduce stink bug damage in peppers or tomatoes with any of these things. So I don't advise spraying any of these for stink bugs. I think you're wasting your money. Um, but there may be some hope. Surround, I know there was a question that came in early, um, emailed about the use of surround. And I know the question was, how do I feel about mixing surround with um, some of the oils, and I, I think it's a, you know, that might, that might cause some problems, but surround by itself, I've been amazed. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a kaolinite clay. It's a really fine powder. Um, so it's a natural inert um, product. And what it does is create a white film, powdery film, can help protect against sun scalds. So things like tree fruit, fruiting vegetables, it's good to spray it to protect against sun scald anyway, but it does have effects on insects. They don't like it, I can promise you that. They do not like a white powder to walk across with their little tarsi, which are their, which are their shoes or their feet. They don't like touching that. They usually leave the plant. Um, sometimes it affects visually. They are expecting the plant to look a certain color and now it's white and it's enough to maybe cause some insects to move on. Um, so the combination of both tactile stimulation not being there or even driving them off and, and visually what it does to a plant, it can help you with some insect control. So there's a lot of data out there on a lot of different insects. We actually tried it and got excellent results against stink bugs. We did some lab trials where we caged plants with and without surround and the bugs did not get on the surround treated plants. They got on the other plants, sprayed it in the field. You can see this here. This is, you can see the white, that's a surround plot. Um, and then we harvested fruit from these plots and these are the data. So we also tested essential oils in Ecotech. That's an orange, the silver or the gray is kaolinite or surround. And we reduced the percentage of stink bug damage to the peppers. Um, these are across multiple years, multiple harvests. Um, that's very good control with a, with a clay powder against the pest that's really, really damaging. So if you can, if it does fit in your system, surround will give you some protection against stink bugs. So um, definitely want you to hear that it's, it is an option. Now, washing surround off of produce may not fit for everybody because you got to get that off of there. Um, but, you know, it isn't hard to, to really wash off. So that's an option. I'm going to end with that one. Um, keep in mind the one beauty of a lot of these organic insecticides is that they, many, most of them mesh well with integrated pest management and biological control agents. So using any of these products that we've discussed, um, they do mesh well in a system with also having some natural enemies because you're not going to flare these um, pests 
because you're killing natural enemies. A lot of times you're not going to kill natural enemies with any of these. So that's a beauty of, of using these Omri and, um, insecticides. Um, and I want to thank my crew uh, and all the work that they do. Can't do it without it. And um, Helen Dowdy on the Eastern Shore, who runs our trials out there, we, we do trials you know, statewide because of the great people that I have. Um, and I'll stop sharing. You know what? I'm not going to stop sharing. I'm going to go back to my, uh, maybe go back to my title slide, but I'll, I'll open it up um, for questions and I might have to bring up a slide. So I'm going to just leave this, leave this going. So be happy to answer any questions, I guess, type them into the chat. And Ben, I guess. Great. You'll, Thank you. yeah. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, so everyone, uh, feel free to type in your questions. Alternatively, you should now have the ability to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question out loud. Um, but uh, let's start with a question um, that Pete just asked, which was, what is the danger to bees with each of these options? Yeah, very good. Um, most of the... Uh, most of the materials are a lot are a lot safer for bees than synthetic insecticides. So I'll start with that. Um, there are some that have some levels of bee toxicity. So things like uh, pyganic pyrethrins. If you spray a bee, you know you're going to kill it or or really Im Im impair it. However, um, bees uh, or pyrethrins are naturally repellent to a lot of insects. And bees are, are especially honeybees, are excellent at detecting some of these things like pyrethroids or pyrethrins. Um, so it's possible you spray pyganic and the bees stay away from the crop anyway, because they know it's on there. Um, it, the other thing going for you with pyganic is that it's short-lived. So you can spray and maybe a little bit, you know, the residue is not gonna stick around and bees can come later. But you always want to avoid spraying anything, you know, on flowering plants. Uh, that's never a good thing. So always avoid that if you can. And um, most of these products aren't going to give you a residual that's really that that toxic. Some of them, once they dry, they're not going to be an issue for bees like your spinosids and and uh, things. So, yeah, excellent question. And I think there's still some work to do. I will say because any of the uh, the more we dig into pollinators, the more we unravel that there's more questions. And I think so much work was done on honeybees. And the truth is, they're not the most important pollinator most of the time. And we should care more about our, um, our native bees that are doing most of the pollinating. And we've found that sometimes those bees are a lot more susceptible than the honeybee was. So you know, there's a wealth of research and then there's a wealth of new questions that have that have arisen. Um, I'm not going to get into all this and I'm not an expert on on bee toxicity, but excellent question and always something to be thinking about. But never spray, you know, when things are are blooming. I think that never, never makes makes sense. So go ahead, Ben. I yeah, I'm not really reading them. I'm going to let you. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I was just muted. That's okay. um, so a question from Chris. Uh, when during the year is the best time to start surround application? Or uh, I'd have to know whether um, it's for stink bugs or uh, I'm assuming since I would protect fruit. So, you know, you're talking during the summer. So you want to you want to kind of prevent sun scald with with that spray anyway. So protecting fruit, which is also the time when things like stink bugs are going to be coming in anyway. Um, they're they're going after the fruiting body. So um, that should that so should probably Chris help. Chris just yeah. clarified he was asking specifically around tree fruit. Um, so stink bugs, yeah. Japanese beetles, etc. Yeah, I think for the you know, protecting fruit. So, you know, that would be during your, 
you know, during your later months, you wouldn't need it early on until until fruit are produced on on any of those crops. I I'm not a tree fruit entomologist, but I would would imagine it's the same, um, you know, than the work that I've done with fruiting vegetables. Great. Um, so another question that I um. So I'm going to get a lot, pronounce a lot of these wrong. So uh, anything to help with spotted wing drosophila? Oh, boy. Yeah, I've not done a, uh, I'm not a small fruit entomologist either. So I've not done spotted wing drosophila work. For those who don't know, um, who aren't growing berries or anything, uh, this invasive fruit fly can um, lay its eggs in intact fruit. You know, unlike our normal Drosophila fruit flies, this one is a pest of of uh, fruit that doesn't already have a you know a cut or a hole in it. So, number one pest of small fruit right now in many areas of the country, and really really hard pest to control. Um, takes multiple sprays, and you know I I think there is a Spinosin um, bait product that that is around. Uh, I, you know, I haven't run, I haven't run spotted wing drosophila trials, but I do know that it is susceptible to spinosad. So there's OMRI certified um, fruit fly baits. And, um, you know, I would guess that's a really good option. I, yeah, I don't want to be saying things that I, that I'm not hundred percent sure of, but probably the Azera, the, the combination of the azadiractins and the pyrethrins, but I do know it takes multiple sprays um, because these fruit flies just keep coming um, when you got your you got your ripe ripe fruit out there um, yeah I wish wish I had my own personal data to share with that but I don't great and just so folks know I'm gonna be relaunching the poll that we asked uh, for you to tell us a bit about yourself just so I know a bunch more people joined um, so if you could take a moment to answer that while we're digging into further questions. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so what what product would you recommend around P aphids? P aphids, okay. Um, that's not a hard one to kill. So you know you've got these soap products. Um, which are really good on really good on most of the aphids. Um, it's not going to disrupt natural enemies. Um, and then you've got your oils, um, and even the things like like your azadirac. And so there's a lot of options. Uh, I'm guessing this is on peas that they got the pea aphid problem. The other thing, uh, you know, pea aphid, you know, give it a chance. Let natural enemies come in. One problem with P. aphid is it can get going so early in the spring um, and the natural enemies haven't woke up yet. And that's why P. aphid can be a problem. But once they do wake up, the lady beetles come in and the other things come in, they really start to knock back those aphids. So it's one of these like give, give natural enemies a chance um, and maybe don't spray something that's gonna kill them. So don't spray a pyganic. Um, but maybe stick with some of these soaps and oils and then and then let them, once you start seeing lady beetles and things like that, you're probably good to go. Um, now, if there's virus issues transmitted by these aphids, that's a, that's a, that's a big problem and um, might, might be really hard to avoid um, keeping the virus from being transmitted with any of these things. Um, but yeah, really good, really good question. Great. So uh, Ken asked a question, and Ken, you might need to clarify a bit, but he said, uh, seed, seed corn maggot, question mark, broadcast application, seed treatment. Um, Boy. I'm hoping you, you, you mean you understand what he's getting at. I understand what he's getting at, and I can tell you, um, just this week, I sat in on a meeting of uh, entomologists and one of the biggest problems uh, that we're facing with synthetic, now this isn't even organic growers, these are conventional growers 
is loss of products to control seed corn maggots and cabbage maggots, very similar close cousins, um, fly pests. So onion maggot, seed corn maggot, um, cabbage maggot, we're, we're dealing with a very, very similar pest problem. Fly drops an egg in organic matter and the maggots just eat whatever's in sight. And that could be a seed, that could be the roots of a plant. Uh, so one of the problems with organic growers, it's not a problem, it's a great thing, is the, they use a lot of organic matter. Um, well, this is just perfect for things like seed corn maggots. They love organic matter. So these flies are, are flying around in the spring and they're laying eggs on organic matter. And then you got maggots in your soil and it you know, can affect a lot of different crops. I've seen them destroy a pumpkin seed, snap bean seeds, and um, a lot of others. So enough, enough about the pest. What can we do about it? I will say it is a challenge. There are uh, some of the heaviest, more toxic insecticides still registered for conventional growers are used to target these maggots because they need something that's just really, really toxic and can last a long time. So things like Lorsban, Chlorpyrifos is the go-to product. Well, it may be going away, gone. So now what do we have? So it's a big problem for conventional growers and now organic growers. Um, I think there is a lot of opportunity to research this problem right now. And I'm, I'm willing to start looking at this because I think we've got some exciting, I ran through a lot of kind of new things like your um, Magistines and, and um, there's some new Bouveria, some enema pathogenic fungal. The one thing about a soil pest is some of those products work really, really well in moist soils. So you're, that's exactly what you're going to have for to even have a seed corn maggot problem. So we need to do some more testing, but I think there will be a lot of opportunity with those kind of products. Um, I don't have enough data to say this is the best one, but I there's two right there I just mentioned that I think are worth investigating a little bit further. Possibly some spinosins. Spinosin will kill maggots, but how do you get spinosin you know, to the target? You gotta like incorporate it into the soil somewhat. Um, that's another one that I think should be in the mix of things to uh, test against, but excellent question to a really hard pest problem. But I would give Magistine a look and I, I would like to look at that too, um, some, some uh, future trials here. Great. Uh, so again, reminder, just if you could fill out the, the survey, it'll help us tailor future programming. Um, looks like there's still a bunch of folks who haven't had a chance to fill it out yet. Should just be a click of the button. Um, and then another question for you, uh, Dr. Buhar, is um, do you have experience with spraying neem followed by spraying surround on cold crops? Was that, I forgot, did you say combined or, or followed no, by? So this, followed by. Oh, okay. Um, I think followed by, you know, would be fine because my concern was the tank mix of the, of the two, you know, maybe causing some clogging problems. But no, I think uh, starting with an azadir. So if you're talking about a cold crop, you got to, you know, you got, you got worms, left pests, and you got flea beetles, and then you got... Um, you know, harlequin bugs and things like that. So azadiract and neem oil will help against your lepidopteran pests, um, maybe knock back your flea beetles a little bit. And then the surround will help against things like the harlequin bug. So I, I like the combo. I think it's got, there's some logic there. Um, so yeah, I've not tested that one, two punch, but it seems to make some sense. I mean, I would, I would throw BT or uh, Entrust in for the LEPs, um, though, because they're, they're just outstanding against those feeding caterpillars. Great. Well, I think I got most of the questions. I apologize if I missed any. If, if there's any kind of pressing questions with our last few minutes, I'd encourage you to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask or, or quickly type in a question. Um, so give a moment for anyone who wants to unmute themselves to do so and 
ask a question? Yeah, and I'll also, um, I'm going to type in my email in case anyone, uh, I hope, hope I'm not opening myself up for, I actually enjoy these email correspondence uh, after the fact, because I can send sometimes some documentation of, of some things. And, um, you know, my email's in there. If someone has a follow-up, you know, again, some of these are really difficult problems. And I, I might not have experience with it, but I'm, you know, I could also ask some others that I think might and um, give you some things that are worth a try. So. Great. Well, I'm going to, you know, post a, a feedback poll as well. Um, and while we're doing that, I just wanted to, you know, on behalf of everyone, thank Dr. Kuhar um, for all the great information. We've recorded the webinar, so I hope it's okay with you if we, we post that recording. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Which will have, that'll have the slides for anyone who um, wants to delve deeper into anything. You can always pause the video and, and look at each of the individual slides. And again, just thanks so much for, for all the time. Um, and Dan, I see you've raised your hand. So if you, if you have a question, feel free to ask. To jump in. Somebody, somebody wanted to know about trichogramma sources. There's a uh, IPM is part of the name, but I can't remember the full name. They're in New York State, yep. and they have it. an excellent program for dealing with corn earworm and trichogramma. They can they can tell you everything you need to know, timing included. But you got to yep. order it all in advance. Yep. Very but good. You, Thanks. Uh, I. That's Carol Carol Glenister at IPM Labs. Yeah, in, exactly. In in Lock, New York. Yeah, I um, worked a lot with it with that system. And uh, for things like European corn borer, um, and uh, yeah, there's some corn earworms a little harder to control with those. But there, in a, in addition to trichogramma striniae, there's some other trichogramma. Um, I didn't get into the biological control agents, but that was worth mentioning. Um, you know, these are little tiny parasitic wasps that do nothing but sting lepidopteran eggs. And, you know, you, you release these and they develop in the eggs and then there's more wasps to go find more eggs. And, and um, you know, it's, we've done some really good trials on like peppers and sweet corn in, in the Northeastern US um, where we've actually knocked back European corn borer pretty well with uh, just releases of this. So yeah, you can get those from IPM labs. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, and you had one more question come through, which was, do you know, do you or someone you know trial beneficial insects? Yeah, I mean, um, there's, you know, a lot of different options. I'll, I'll just kind of generally say, say this one quickly. The best uses for beneficial releases of natural enemies is in closed systems. So your predatory mites and um, sometimes your lady beetles and lace wings. Those, the best scenarios are when you have a closed system um, where they don't fly away when you, when you release them. However, there are things um, like Pediobius, which is a parasitoid of Mexican bean beetle larvae, um, where if you get them out early, they will, um, so basically you're releasing a parasitized Mexican bean beetle larva when you put that in the field in a little cup, the parasitoid wasps emerge and, and sting any Mexican bean beetle larvae that are, that are gonna come afterwards. If you get them out early, they, they can sustain themselves dirt throughout the season. They will not overwinter. So you gotta do it again the next year, but that's been a program that's worked well. The releases of trichogramma we just mentioned, predatory mites um, are, are awesome. Um, and yeah, there's definitely some things, but I tell you, be careful getting a huge shipment of adult lady beetles and dumping them in your garden and, and they, they fly off. Um, it might be a waste of money. And, um, but getting things when they're in an immature stage and in a closed system, those, those tactics seem to work a lot better. Great. Well, I think we're just on time. So I wanted to, again, thank, 
thank you, Doctor, for uh, joining us today and, and for sharing all this great uh, insights and all these great studies going on.